Well, welcome everyone. And uh, I'm, I'm really delighted that Susan could join us today to tell us a little bit about the history of the, the Mimosa. Um, now, Susan has, has, has traveled the world uh, to Argentina lots of times. I'm trying to think when we first met, but it was uh, many years ago, Susan, I think after you'd written um, that wonderful book, Sebastian's Pride, yes. now sadly yes. out of print, and uh, just probably before you, you, you wrote uh, Mimosa. Um, but uh, uh, um, um, both of which, in, in their completely different ways, I just found fascinating books. Um, anyway, so we're very much looking forward to hearing um, what you can, what you're going to tell us today about about the history of that fascinating little boat. So I'm going to hand over to you, Susan. Well, thank you so much, Ed. Thank you for this invitation. Um, <clears throat> I'm so delighted to have been asked to talk actually on the subject, which is so very dear to my heart. Um, I'm afraid I don't have any beautiful, like scenic slides that I've seen on previous talks, but Jeremy, I know, will be providing many next week, and I know we're all in for a treat. Um, initially, my interest in the mimosa was purely personal, in that um, my ancestor, Thomas, Thomas Green, was the 21-year-old doctor who accompanied the Welsh well settlers to Patagonia. Um, and I knew nothing about her, really, except that her name was um, linked to a story that has made her a legend. Can we have the first slide? Um, this is a painting that would have been commissioned by her then owners from Liverpool. Um, it shows Mimosa entering north and south Sydney Heads, now the property of the Oriel Mimosa Gallery in Clandilo in Carmarthenshire. Um, the Mimosa was a three-masted clipper of just over 447 ton and was built for speed. Um, the name clipper is derived from the word clip, as in to go a fair clip. She was constructed in Aberdeen by Alexander Hall and Sons, the leading shipbuilders in Aberdeen in 1853 for Vining and Killy, Liverpool merchants and partners in trading. She was intended for the South American trade to Brazil, as well as the China trade, uh, the tea trade. The only stipulation demanded by her Liverpool owners was that she be medium sized so that a full cargo could be guaranteed on every voyage and that she be fast. Can we have the next slide? the Maritime, Merseyside Maritime Museum. Um, over the years, little by little, I sought to discover as much of the mimosa as I could. This involved several trips to the Merseyside Maritime Museum in Liverpool, where the registers of the Liverpool ships are held and obtaining photocopies of the various logs in um, uh, maritime museums in Britain. I, I remember the very first time actually I went and I asked, do you have anything on a ship called the Mimosa? And the librarian said, you're not Welsh, are you? She said, a lot of people from Wales come and ask about that ship. And when that uh, huge thing was wheeled in and she opened the page of Mimosa's register, I saw Mimosa written in huge, huge letters in um, by a clerk probably who had a dip pen it was all splodgy a little bit. And after that, I thought, oh my goodness, this is such, this is human, <laughs> such a human story. And eventually I was able to find out details of her entire life from her construction in Aberdeen to her voyages to China for the tea trade, Northern Brazil for the sugar and cotton trade and to a sad demise in New Calabar where she was dismasted and converted to a storage hulk for palm oil on the mosquito infested Niger Delta. But it was her voyage to Patagonia in 1865 for which she was famed and has made her a part of Welsh history. The, the voyage to pa Patagonia was above all a human story. And those who boarded the Mimosa on May the 28th, 1865 for a voyage that was unique in the history of the world were ordinary men and women 
who would face the most extraordinary conditions and hardships. Next slide, please, Ed. This is a model actually looking rear from the other side of her, not the front, of the mimosa that was commissioned by the, Mar by the Merseyside Welsh Historical Society and it's in the Immigration Gallery of the Maritime Museum. Um, by 1865, the mimosa was 12 years old and well past her sailing prime. She passed her 10 year life expectancy, considered to be a good lifespan for a clipper and had survived many of her contemporaries who'd come to grief on the high seas. But her seagoing life had not ended and her most memorable voyage lay ahead. A group of Welshmen were in desperate need for a ship to transport 162 men, women and children gathered in Liverpool to Patagonia. As the ship originally charged for the purpose, the Halton Castle was still at sea on the scheduled date of departure, feared lost in the treacherous seas around Cape Horn from its voyage from Bal Valparaiso. And the captain of a second ship who had been approached, who himself was Welsh, categorically refused to transport any of his countrymen, especially women and children, to a place that was so remote and where none had previously settled. Unless a ship could be found with a captain willing to sail to Patagonia, the whole venture was in danger of collapse. Next slide. Um, this is a brief outline of events leading up to 1865. Um, 1847, um, the future founder of the Welsh colony Patagonia, Michael D. Jones, uh, visits Welsh communities in Ohio. And he observed that although the first generation of Welsh uh, maintained their language, their children and certainly their grandchildren did not and were being assimilated into the culture of their adopted country. Emigration from Wales was um, a flood at that time that could not be turned. But what he wondered if that tide of emigration could be directed to one place only that was remote from English influence that seemed to be sweeping Wales. Parts of South Africa, Vancouver Island even, Australia, even Palestine were at various times considered and rejected. Um, that same year in 1847, the British government had published a report on the state of education in Wales um, in three books for North, South and Central Wales, known in Wales today as the treachery of the blue books. That report was scathing um, in its view of nonconformity of the literature of Wales and I quote, the evil of the Welsh language. Welsh school children, were for stigmatized for speaking Welsh, caned and encouraged to inform on those heard speaking it. Um, I think the report quite simply was an oppression of the Welsh language um, that I've been told persisted until the, the 1940s. Um, 1856, sorry, the second point, the idea of Patagonia as a place to which to direct the wave of immigration from Wales is born. 1859, a carpenter, Hugh Hughes, um, gives an, a very enthusiastic endorsement of Patagonia in a basement of a Welsh chapel in Liverpool. The audience was sparse. There were hardly anybody there, hardly anybody interested, but it attracted a cabinet maker called Morris Humphreys, two brothers from Birkenhead who would sail with the families on the Mimosa six years later, and a printer from Liverpool, Lewis Jones, the future leader of the colony in Patagonia. 1861, immigration committee is made up of prominent Welshmen um, that included Michael D. Jones, of course, and Thomas Love Jones Parry of Madryn Castle um, in North Wales. Um, and through them application was made to the Argentine government for land in Patagonia through the Argentine consul in Liverpool, an Englishman with business interests in Argentina. 
It won the approval of the Minister of the Interior of the Argentine government, Dr. Guillermo Rausen, after whom the capital of the province of Chubut is named. 1862, um, Lewis Jones and Love Jones Parry sailed to Argentina to negotiate terms with the government and to explore land in Eastern Patagonia for settlement. Um, although he's not mm, among those who settled in Patagonia, the name of Sir Love Jones Parry, as he later became, was inseparable from the movement of establishing a Welsh colony in Patagonia. I think he was an interesting person, rare among landlords. He spoke Welsh among his tenants, had a love of Welsh poetry and had a bardic name. Whether or not it was a condition to his involvement and his um, funding of the trip for himself and Lewis Jones, the place where Mimosa's passengers would embark on July 28, 1865, was given the name of his family estate, Madryn. Um, this is very brief and, and um, this next point, but um, it's, it's, it was, um, you could spend a whole day talking about it, but a place for the settlement was chosen and in Buenos Aires, an agreement with the Argentine government was signed, whereby the government agreed to make grants of land in the lower Chubut Valley of 100 acres for each family, livestock and seed to future settlers. It wasn't as much as Lewis Jones wanted, but it was a start. Then a handbook for prospective colonists was written by Hugh Hughes, which was printed by Lewis Jones. Um, Again, there'll be more on the handbook later, um, but really with scant regard for accuracy, it extolled Patagonia as the ideal place for a colony. And Patagonia as a place for a Welsh colony was promoted by pulpit, pamphlet, and by word of mouth throughout Wales. Um, in April, men and women would get from Wales and Lancashire begin to arrive in Liverpool to await a ship to take them to Patagonia. How or why the Mimosa was chosen to take the group gathered in Liverpool awaiting the Halton Castle is not known, except that other ships refused to do so. Lewis Jones and another man, Edwin Roberts, who had returned from, to Wales from Wisconsin to be part of the venture, were already in Patagonia making preparations. And some of those gathered in Liverpool were beginning to drift back to their homes, perhaps having second thoughts about the place to which was so isolated or being influenced by the vociferous opposition to the venture in Welsh newspapers. Um, two months before February 25th, the North Wales Chronicle wrote, and I quote, there are plenty of places to emigrate north or south, but Patagonia certainly is the very worst place upon the face of the habitable globe. Finding a ship was imperative and a fading possibility. For Viney and Killy, the timing was perfect. Mimosa had arrived back in Liverpool from her last voyage from Brazil at the beginning of April. And by May, no orders for freight had been received for another outward voyage. They could charter her to carry the passengers to Patagonia and on her return, she could carry goods from one of the Brazilian ports back to Liverpool. The Welsh minister could bear the costs of the refitting. For Vining and Killy, it seemed an ideal and profitable arrangement. For Michael D. Jones, the mimosa was a last desperate hope. Without mimosa, the dream of a Welsh colony in Patagonia might collapse. Come to the next slide. Um, this is a map printed in 1862 to accompany the handbook, um, which was very kindly sent to me by Jeremy Wood. Um, you can see, I don't have a pointer, but you can see New Bay, which is where the Mimosa was going to land. And south of that is the Shubut River where they would um, settle eventually. There's nothing there. I mean, there's, um, no towns, there's no Welsh towns there, but a bit towards Chile, you can see the names of some of the um, indigenous people, including the Tehuelche, um, who would be, you know, 
very, very helpful eventually to the Welsh. Um, up, as uh, Carmen there, Bahia Blanca. Uh, the Rio Negro, which, sorry, which you see to the north, was at that point the border really between the Argentine Republic and the rest of Patagonia was really unsettled, unknown. Um, so it actually was very helpful to the Argentine Republic that the Welsh asked them permission to settle. It strengthened, you know, they were having boundary um, uh, discussions with Chile. So it definitely helped them in their settlement of there. Um, Mimosa had not been designed to carry passengers. And before she could sail to Patagonia, she had to be refitted for her new role. According to receipts in the archives of Bangor University, the cost of provisioning, refitting and chartering the Mimosa came to 1,708 pounds, eight shillings and nine pence, more than 200,000 pounds in today's money. Payment for which was the responsibility of Michael D. Jones. Passengers were required to pay 12 pounds for adults, six for children, babies traveling free. Although inability to pay was not a hindrance to sailing. These were anxious days for Michael D. Jones as he scraped together every penny from his small annual salary and the rents from his wife's farm that he'd, she'd inherited. It was barely enough. It was not enough to buy a medical chest and had it not been for the brother-in-law of Hugh Hughes in Liverpool who borrowed 30 pounds with interest to buy one, Mimosa might have sailed without one and it was delivered to the ship just two days before sailing. Thomas Green arrived in Liverpool earlier in the month having completed his medical studies in Dublin and Edinburgh, possibly looking for a post of ship surgeon. It's not known how he came to hear about the need for a doctor to sail with the settlers to Patagonia, but he signed a contract with Michael D. Jones in which he accepted the position. Um, that document is also in Bangor. Refittings completed, um, the crew, including Thomas Green and three men working their passages to New Bay, went aboard two days before sailing. The, cap the captain had come aboard the day before. Um, that captain, Captain Pepperell, was relatively inexperienced. He knew the routes um, to the Brazilian ports as far as Rio de Janeiro, but knew nothing of the seas further south and had never sailed with passengers before. Uh, determined to assert his authority, he brooked no opposition to his orders, however irrational those orders were. On him depended the lives of the passengers and crew. Finally, the passengers boarded and Mimosa was ready to depart and would sail with the tide the following day, Sunday, May the 28th. It's impossible to imagine the feelings of Michael D. Jones as Mimosa prepared to depart joy that the dream of the Welsh colony in Patagonia had become a reality. The eternal worry of how much more would have to be paid for the real realization of it. And disappointment that the wave of emigration he'd hoped to direct to Patagonia was less than a ripple. That so few men were farmers, so many were babies and young children, about 50 in all. Anxiety that the only doctor who had applied for the post was so young and that not being Welsh was not expected to stay for long and that he would never be able to pay the agreed amount promised him. It's impossible too to imagine the feelings of optimism, apprehension, sadness at leaving families of those who boarded. Um, one young couple who boarded um, without their baby son who died in Liverpool while awaiting the Halton Castle. For many, it was an escape from poverty a chance to own their own land, which was impossible in Wales. For Mimosa's passengers, there was no turning back, no return to Wales, and whatever the outcome, Mimosa's name would be forever linked with it. Next slide. Um, this is a sort of, well, Mimosa diary. Um, embarking from Liverpool, they ran into a storm. Um, the first 
event was a wedding on board June the 2nd. This was, a, well, not such a young couple. They came from the same village in Wales and nobody knows why they waited to board the mimosa before getting married, but she was pregnant and would, um, about three months pregnant. So could have been, that was why. Um, then uh, June the 9th, the first death, a little girl, Catherine Thomas died. Uh, and the diagnosis written in the ship's log was croup. So obviously something like um, uh, bronchopneumonia. And the day she was buried at sea, um, a little boy died. Um, two-year-old son of Aaron and Rachel Jenkins, James Jenkins. The, um, what was written, the diagnosis written in the log again was cancrum oris of the mouth. Cancrum oris is and was a horrible disease, um, can, sort of um, gangrous uh, ulcers and they eaten, I mean, his part of his cheek was probably eaten away, exposing teeth. It's sometimes called the face of poverty um, because it is associated with poverty and extreme malnutrition. Um, he would have died anyway. It was not uh, a disease that was curable. Um, then uh, birth of a boy, um, six, around the 16th, oh, sorry, June the 13th, 16 days after leaving, they passed the islands of Madeira um, the, the first really, really dramatic event, the captain wants to cut the women's hair, 16th June. Um, he discovered that the heads of some of the, some of the passengers were dirty, which was hardly surprising given the no water to wash. I don't know how you'd wash your hair on that ship. So he decided in the interest of hygiene, possibly to prevent typhus that was carried by lice, that the women's hair should be shorn and washed with soap and water. So without telling them what was happening, he, uh, one young girl uh, was seized by one of the crew who had shears in hand, snipping at them. At her scream of terror, um, good old Hugh Hughes bounded over, demanded to know what the hell <laughs> Captain Pepperell was doing which of course her father came to, uh, who was threatened to be put in manacles. And um, in the end, a compromise, oh no, sorry, even more dramatic. He took out his pistol, aimed it at Hugh Hughes at his chest and fired into the sea. <laughs> um, it didn't improve relationships between the captain and the passengers. And furthermore, he denied passengers access to the quarter deck, further restricting their access to air and exercise. Um, after that, he agreed to compromise whereas, whereby Thomas Green would inspect the women's hair with him. Um, then a few days later, they saw sharks in the sea and some of the young boys plunged into the sea and were towed by a rope tied to a bowsprit. Um, no <laughs> niggling oh, health and safety like measures it. on the mimosa. <laughs> and um, then there was a birth of a girl, uh, Rachel Jenkins, to, and she was not destined for a long life. They crossed the equator and another little boy dies. Um, this was John Davies who had hydrocephaly there's a photograph of him a little later. Um, that was fatal, of course, and um, his death, well, I don't know, probably a welcome release. Um, then they see the coast of Brazil, another little girl dies, Elizabeth Solomon, and she was two of pneumonia. She was her parents' only child. And, um, Another little girl began to feel, get a cold, which um, possibly, um, you know, changed into pneumonia. And they saw the first site of Patagonia and the Valdez Peninsula, 
the 26th of July. And um, they sailed into New Bay at moonlight and um, fired a cannon, Mimosa fired her cannon and an answering salvo of gunfire was heard from the cliff top. They'd been seen and um, they had arrived. Can we have the next slide? Oh no, okay. Now we're going to have, um, uh, Ed's going to show a segment of um, Hugh Edwards BBC broadcast of um, Patagonia. The date is Friday the 28th of July 1865 and the crossing in rather primitive conditions has taken two months. The pioneers, around 160 of them, are about to set foot for the first time on the shores of Argentina. But what they discover here is not what they've been promised. They landed on a barren shore with no reliable supply of fresh water. A small advance party was waiting for them, but they'd made scant preparation for the arrival. Local historian Fernando Coronato showed me the makeshift man-made hollows in the rock that may have been used as stores or even, he believes, as temporary shelters. Fernando, it's an amazing place, uh, you know, with an amazing view, really, of the bay, but these remains, why are they so significant? What are they? They're important because they are the remains of uh, the first uh, Welsh footstep in Patagonia. It's a mark of the hopes of a people who were, were searching for a new land to build a new life with freedom and, well, sun and fair weather. <laughs> yeah. Legend has it that the Welsh sheltered in these natural caves. That may or may not be so. But nonetheless, there is very clear evidence of their presence here. Still visible today are the marks they left as they dug out clay blocks in their first attempts at building. When you look at how primitive, how basic this is, yes. um, in the first month after they arrived, did they suffer a lot of hardship? I mean, what happened to the women and the children? Uh, they were, four babies died, and uh, an adult person, Catherine Davis, is died too. Catherine Davis was from Llandrillo. She was 38. Her baby son had already died on that long voyage across the Atlantic. I'm just struck, Fernando, by the thought that although they had made some preparations, it wasn't enough, was it? Is it because people were simply too idealistic and they wanted it to succeed, they hadn't really thought it through? Well, the propaganda was, uh, had been very strong in Wales and the, the Patagonia uh, was uh, drawn to a fantastic region and the reality is not that way. There's no easy way to say this, but those first settlers had been very badly misled and here's the proof. It's a little booklet for prospective migrants, written by Hugh Hughes in 1862. He would be part of that first wave. And in it, he describes splendid expanses of green forest, herds of animals, rich pastures, and the rainfall, he says, is as regular as it is in Wales. At best, the leaders of this venture were guilty of wishful thinking. The negatives ignored, the positives greatly exaggerated. There was a heavy price. Before long, this unforgiving terrain had claimed its first victim. David Williams was a cobbler from Aberystwyth. And on his first day ashore, he clambered up from the beach and started walking. He was looking for that fertile valley that he'd read about in the booklet. He was never seen again. And two years later, his remains were found at a place called Pantereskin the veil of bones, and he was identified by his ring and his cobbler's thimble.
Okay. Um, the landing, um, this is from a painting which is in um, Patagonia, and I'm afraid I don't know the who painted it. Um, the groups were bought in rowboats from, uh, from the ship. Um, it was really cold. The cold pierced their woolen jackets and that were not made for the Patagonian winter. They were told actually that clothing that was that they had in Wales would be suitable. They were so excited about seeing this new land that they all dressed in their Sunday dress. William Jones of Bala, he's carried the small coffin bearing the little body of Mary, his daughter, who died in the early hours of 27th. She would be the first to be buried um, in the new land. Um, I'm actually going to read Thomas Green, um, when he left Patagonia at the end of the first year, he wrote to um, a brother of his who was living in Liverpool at the time. And this letter was later published in the Liverpool Mercury. It was actually Fernando who drew my attention to it some years ago. So this is the letter. Um, on their arrival in New Bay, the only place prepared as shelter for the immigrants was a long wooden shed, not large enough to accumulate all. And the men and women had to sleep partitioned off how they could, the rest shifting as they, best they might. Their food had to be cooked out of doors, and which was constantly covered by clouds of sand and penetrating even their clothes. The water was scarce and bad, and had to be carried over two miles from a stagnant pool formed by recent rains and was of a whitish color because of the nature of the soil. The country he describes as being nothing but level plains as far as the eye can reach, covered with low stunted bushes, much resembling the firs in our own country. The game, he says, is not much of any kind, some guanacos, foxes, etc. The birds are species of emu, wild duck, all hard to get on account of the level nature of the country. They're obliged to kill a horse for food. And he tells me that he was very glad to eat seagulls and owls and says he killed a fox, but had not the good fortune to partake of its flesh. Um, for, well, more than the, um, hunger and discomfort was the constant fear of Indians. They had no protection, only 17 firearms between them, and they knew that they would be helpless should the Indians attack. Every fall of silence, every twig that cracked, every spiral of dust seen in the distance threw them into panic. One day they knew the Indians would come. The only question was when. Some of the women were pregnant, even normal exertion tired them, especially those with young children to care for. An elderly couple who came alone were too old and too frail for the difficulties encountered, and it was too late to say that they should not have come. Children began to cough, noses began to run. They whimpered from the cold and hunger. There was no milk for the babies, as the men did not know how to milk the semi-wild cows delivered by Lewis Jones. Um, from Argentina. They needed warmth to prevent coughs and colds turning into bronchitis and pneumonia. For William and Catherine Jones of Bala, tragedy struck again as their only surviving daughter, 16 month old Jane, died of pneumonia. She was actually the last to be buried in New Bay, her sister Mary being the first. Mimosa remained anchored in the bay. Uh, and groups of men left New Bay and trekked towards the Shubut, about 40 miles south, to make a road for the others to follow. In the wild terrain, they became disoriented. Some became separated from the groups, from one another, and all suffered such raging thirst that some were reduced to drinking their own urine. Thirteen days after their arrival, Elizabeth, the wife of the cabinet maker, Morris Humphreys, who had attended the meeting, in the chapel basement in Liverpool six years before, gave birth to a girl. In a hut he had roofed from the planks of wood um, 
dismantled from Mimosa's birth. She was named Mary after little Mary Jones who died on the Mimosa and was buried on the first day of the arrival. A range of hills in the area yeah, of New Bay is called Rinia Mary in Welsh or Lomas Maria in Spanish after her. She was the first Welsh baby to be born in Patagonia and her birth gave them hope that despite the difficulties that seemed insurmountable, they would survive in the land to which they'd come. Um, Mimosa remained in New Bay for up to six weeks until the beginning of September to give time for the unloading of furniture and belongings and dismantling of the wood used in her refitting, paid for by Michael D. Jones and hence belonged to the colony. When Mimosa's anchor was raised and her sails filled out in the wind, those watching her departure must have felt feelings akin to panic and loss. She was the last remaining link with the outside world, with Wales and with the families there. With Mimosa gone, they were truly alone, isolated in the most desolate part of the world without a means to leave it. With Mimosa gone, the settlers left New Bay and under incredible difficulties, all eventually reached the Shibut, where Lewis Jones, accompanied by an Argentine official to divide up the lots of land, um, they arrived from Del Carmen, which is um, just uh, over the border into Argentina. Um, he encountered a furious, angry group. It was too late to plant seed. The supplies of food had practically gone and Lewis Jones was forced to admit that little more help could be guaranteed from the Argentine government. Furious himself that um, he was divested of his role as leader, he left, Lewis Jones left for Buenos Aires by schooner, where he would remain for the next two years. Accompanying him were several others, including Thomas Green, who later wrote to his brother that nothing but a want induced him to leave. Can we have the next slide, Ed? Uh, this is round the valley, um, which we took a few years ago. Um, the first years were difficult beyond imagining. Again and again, the colony came perilous, perilously close to collapse. Again and again, with the help of Guillermo Rausen and under the influence of Lewis Jones's fierce persu persuasion, they started all over again. After two years, the population had been reduced to 90, many of whom were women and children. On the 25th anniversary of the arrival in New Bay, 53 of the original 160 passengers remained. But against all odds and, incredible, and despite incredible hardships, the colony in Patagonia survived. Every day the past was a triumph. Every day without mishap was a miracle that gave Mimosa's people hope to carry on. Courage they already had in abundance. Um, in um, about seven months after their arrival, the Tehuelche, who they, so, who they so feared, came. At the wedding of Edwin Roberts and Anne Jones, who had traveled with her family on the Mimosa, an old Indian and his wife appeared on horseback. Both the Welsh and the Tehuelche were terrified of one another. Neither could speak the other's language, but a bond of mutual trust was formed. Um, and a woman, it's not known exactly who, placed her baby in the old Tohelchi woman's arms. In time, the Tohelchi taught the young Welsh men to ride the horses they gave them and how to hunt. They traded guanaco skins um, that kept them warmer than the thin blankets in return for bara, um, Welsh for bread, a word which henceforth became the Tohelchi word for bread. Over the years, the original settlers were joined by others from Wales, US, from a colony, in Rio Grande do Sol in Brazil. With the increase in numbers, they established towns like Gaiman, Trillo, Dolavan, and Rausen became the capital of the province of Chubut. They, they explored westwards to the foothills of the Andes and established farms and settlements in some of the most beautiful areas of South America. Um, for Thomas Green too, the voyage of the to the to Patagonia was a turning point in his life. After departing from Patagonia with Lewis Jones, 
he went to a wild area in the south of the province of Buenos Aires, where the following year, his five brothers and three first cousins joined him from Ireland. He eventually relocated to Uruguay, where he remained for the rest of his professional life, returning to Ireland after retirement, where he died in 1922. Throughout his years in Argentina and Uruguay, he maintained a contact of sorts with Michael D. Jones through Michael D. Jones's elder son, Mihangel, who became a physician at the British Hospital in Buenos Aires. Could we have the next slide? Um, <clears throat> on May the 29th, 2015, the sesquicentenary of the voyage uh, of the Mimoso celebrated in Liverpool. Um, thousands converged in Liverpool for the three-day event that culminated in the unveiling of a plaque on Prince's Pier. The great-granddaughter of Michael D. Jones, Leonard Roberts de Gonzales, OBE, traveled from Patagonia for the occasion with some of the students of the Welsh school in Trelew, the town named after her other grandfather, great-grandfather, Lewis Jones. The Argentine ambassador was present. Um, cultural delegations from Wales, the first minister of Wales, descendants of the passengers, Hugh Edwards came, dignitaries from the city of Liverpool and members of the Merseyside Welsh Historical Society who'd worked so hard and for so long uh, for the monument of the Mimosa to be erected and who'd planned and organized the whole event. Um, I would just like to end actually with a couple of paragraphs from my book. Um, it's not long. Okay. The day of disembarkation at New Bay on the desolate beach that is now called Puerto Madryn is celebrated every 28th day of July throughout Wales and Patagonia. The day known as Gwili Glaniad, the celebration of the landing, is a public holiday throughout the province of Chubut and in a special day of celebration and thanksgiving for the Welsh in Patagonia. In every history, book and in all the correspondence that has been written and are still being written about the Welsh colony in Patagonia, Mimosa's name is mentioned. She's lauded in poetry and song. And in 1865, a special Mimosa stamp was issued in Argentina to commemorate the centenary of the founding of the province of Chubut. Mimosa was part of a movement that went far beyond the voyage itself. And she became a symbol for the courage it took to endure the hardships, tragedies, and uncertainties encountered in the desolation that was Patagonia. Fate, chance, destiny, or whatever it be called, has given Mimosa a place in history, irrespective of her cargo carrying voyages. The ripples cast by her cutwater, which spread from Liverpool to Patagonia as she sailed into immortality, have not abated. Her name lives on, inseparable from the names of her people, the only passengers she's known to have carried. Thank you. Susan, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm going to um, just finish on this slide here, asking for questions, but also giving you a link in case um, you're interested to read about the Mimosa in, in, in more detail, because the second edition is luckily still available. So Susan, thank you very much indeed. Um, and um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so we can all see each other. And I can see there are already a couple of questions, um, which I'll ask you, Susan, but thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. Oh, thank you for asking, really.